called OK. That's fine. So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, this time uh, is my time as uh, assistant professor to present this conference. And I'm very happy um, because uh, this time we will talk about uh, olive oil. And uh, with us um, uh, this evening, uh, there is uh, Professor Carl Ibsen, who is based at the Department of History, Indiana University, Bloomington. And Professor Ibsen um, um, were, is an historian and uh, um, worked on different topics, uh, such as uh, fascist Italy, uh, children's uh, issues, uh, Emigration history of mocking. Uh, the last um, book uh, was his last book was uh, on uh, uh, history of mocking in Italy, and um, uh, the title of uh, his uh, speech today is "From Cloth Oil to Extra Virgin: The Changing Meaning of the Italian Olive Oil in Recent Centuries." Um, thank you so much, uh, and I would like only to propose you an organization of this uh, meeting. Um, I will give um, um, the um, word to uh, Professor Ibsen, uh, and uh, he will uh, talk to us for 40 minutes, and after we uh, will open the floor and collect um, reflections, uh, questions, uh, and other intervention uh, from uh, students. Thank you so much, uh, and please come. Thanks, thanks very much for the for the introduction, and uh, and thanks to those of you for being here. Um, so, this is a topic I've been working on um, the last few years, um, and indeed. Um, this presentation is based largely on a, a chapter coming out in a book that I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, I open with this image from uh, an important book on olive oil in the 18th century by Domenico Grimaldi, um, which depicts the classic um, olive crusher and press. So on the right, you have the stone wheel rotated by an oxen that's crushing the olives, uh, and then they're put onto uh, woven mats and pressed in the um, in the press, the large single uh, screw press we see in the middle. You can see the oil trickling out at the bottom above um, an alternative method of, which, with two screws. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of the technique of olive oil production in this discussion, although I could. The presentation, this is the best we were able to do in terms of the screen. I hope you can, can, can see it. I'm going to have to switch back and forth a little bit to switch. Um, to switch slides, and unfortunately, I can't see anybody else, but maybe at the end, I'll stop sharing and I'll be able to. Um, so you've already heard a little bit about me. This is my own attempt at a, um, at a biography. Um, I'm originally from California, now also an olive oil producer, um, and uh, <clears throat> I studied at UC Berkeley where I got a string of degrees um, and then came to Indiana in 1994. Um, I did all my dissertation research in Rome. I spent a number of years in Rome um, over the past few decades um, doing research on projects that are that you see here. Those are the are my uh, major publications, including two translations into Italian. Um, I'm a fellow of the American Academy in Rome, uh, another reason that I've spent time there. But lately, my interest has been in, in southern Italy, and I've spent time in Puglia and, to a lesser degree, uh, Sicily. At, uh, at Indiana, I'm the director of something called the IU Food Project, uh, which I helped found a few years back. Um, and I taught in Polenso a couple of years ago in a master's program, uh, and again last summer, although that was also virtual. I'm scheduled to be back there uh, at the end of September, if all goes well. So hopefully, uh, maybe I'll even see some, some of you then. Um, so, um, as I say, I've been working on the history of olive oil. I have one publication already um, on the current situation. Um, I'll talk about that if there's time and the, the uh, delay la fastidiosa blight that has uh, devastated the region uh, that came out in Gastronomica. And then I have the historical piece um, that's due out in a, 
volume called Food Mobilities, edited by Simone Cirotto from, uh, from your university and um, Sam Bender from the University of Toronto. Anyway, yeah, as I say, here are some of the books that I've, uh, I've written before. The, la the latest to come out is the Italian translation of the, the book on smoking, Fumo. I won't spend more time on that. Um, instead, I'm going to say a few words about um, what uh, I might call the modern history um, of olive oil. Not modern in the sense used by European historians when the modern period starts in the uh, 15th century, um, but something a little more intuitive. And I see a major change in um, olive oil history starting in about 1960, uh, in particular because that was the year that Italy passed the first extra virgin law. The terms virgin and extra virgin once upon a time were used very little. They become more frequently used and codified, as I say, uh, in 1960. Uh, since then, extra virgin has had a specific meaning, uh, oil with less than 1% acidity that's uh, acquired by mechanical extraction. I'll talk later on why that's important. Um, and then, um, uh, and those are, you know, uh, in some sense, quantitative measures, but then also qualitative ones that, that uh, extra virgin oil must lack certain disgusting odors, uh, rancidity, putridness, smokiness, mold, worms, and the like. That, of course, has always been a, um, a point of, uh, you know, it's a, sub a subjective um, uh, decision about whether oils have these qualities. And of course, there are tasting panels that have been developed and experts who, who deal in these qualities. It's a sort of a unique foodstuff in that regard. Anyway, in addition to the law of 1960s, the 1960s saw the development of continuous cycle production. Uh, Alfa Laval in Italy was the first to uh, develop those machines. There's a picture on the top right of how they work. I'm not going to go into that uh, today. But the important thing is that as opposed to the picture I showed you before of the crusher and the press, um, continuous cycle production sped up uh, production by a factor of 10 or 20 times. So you could produce a lot more oil in a much shorter period of time, which is crucial for oil because uh, quality oil has to be pressed shortly after the fruit has been harvested. In fact, by law, within 24 hours. That first uh, Italian law of 1960 has been revised and indeed adopted more or less by the EU. And I mentioned here the 2012 law, which I think is the most recent. It has uh, acidity down to 0.8%. Um, uh, specifies that the temperature of, of processing can never rise above 27 degrees Celsius, uh, that the fruit must be pressed within 24 hours of harvest, and so on. The third uh, element in the modern history of olive oil, I'd say, is the development of super high density cultivation. And I should say, this is the history I'm not really going to talk about today. This is the chapter I haven't written yet and uh, I'll be working on it. I'm about to start a sabbatical. I'll be in Italy as I mentioned and this is my plan is to work some more on this period. But super high density cultivation was um, uh, developed in Spain um, who is today the leading uh, producer of olive oil in the world in terms of quantity um, and they found ways to plant trees at a density many times larger than uh, traditional uh, plantings, which might even be as low as 200 trees a uh, hectare, um, and up to 1,600 and even beyond trees per hectare, grown in rows like you see in this picture, harvested mechanically, and so on. Again, that's sort of the modern history of, uh, of olive oil. I'm going to spend most of the, uh, my time today talking about the period before that, starting in the 18th century, which I'll go back to um, in a moment. Um, Olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, Evo, as we now call it, um, has of course uh, is of course today the most privileged fat. We hear criticism of the dangers of consuming too much um, animal fat. Um, seed oils are are uh, accused by some as of being carcinogenic and so on. But everyone loves olive oil. Um, we've even got groups like the American Society of Nutrition. Uh, offering that a Mediterranean diet, and I'll, I'll come back to that, um, uh, rich in extra virgin olive oil uh, is an important defense against non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And there's all kinds of health claims that are made regarding, uh, regarding extra virgin olive oil today. You get television chefs like Nigella Lawson pouring it on most everything that she makes, um, and then even attention to what's going on uh, recently in Italy, 
<clears throat> and this is a quote from the Daily Mail last year, disaster, there's a global olive oil crisis, how a hungry little pest, that's the Tilela, uh, that causes trees to collapse and die is threatening our extra dressing. Well, of course, it's not just threatening the extra virgin dressing of British newspaper readers, but the livelihood of, um, uh, of olive farmers and olive oil producers um, in Puglia and probably beyond. But well, again, I can come back to that. Um, a little picture of, uh, of production today. Um, Spain, as I mentioned, far and away, the leading uh, producer. These are figures from 1993 to 2014. Olive, oil produ olive production, so oil production can uh, fluctuate dramatically from one year to the next. All the olive tree is a so-called alternate bearing tree. It really wants to bear fruit just once every two years. Now, with pruning and practices, we can get it to, to bear fruit every year, but, but the, the amounts vary a great deal. So it is important to look at over a period like this, like a decade, and of course, the time since 2014 has seen other dramatic changes. Uh, but you see here Spain producing twice as much as Italy. Seven years, it's more than that in terms of ratio. Um, the period I'm going to look at back in the 18th century, Italy was far and away the number one producer of oil um, in the world. And that would continue to be the case until the middle of the 20th century when, in fact, Spain matches Italian production and then with the development subsequently of the super high density zooms ahead. Super high density, which is not much developed yet um, in Italy, although it is the technique most frequently used um, in Spain and uh, rather in, in other new growing air regions like uh, Australia and California. Lots of debate about the quality of super high density versus traditional growing, but again, that's probably not something I'll spend a lot of time on today. Here's a map taken from an Italian source, source Frantoio Online. It doesn't give a date, but other um, bits in the piece um, uh, suggest that it may, may be these may be figures for the decade 2009 to 2019. And I dare say um, many Italians are surprised by this by this map. Um, maybe not by the by the observation that the majority of olive oil is produced in the south. Um, uh, you know, here's Puglia with 37 percent. Again, that's almost certainly gone down because of the collapse of growth in the Salento in the far south of the peninsula. But Tuscany is a mere two percent. Tuscan oil, which has the biggest uh, is the biggest brand, the most important brand, if you will, internationally, is a tiny fraction of the total uh, production. It hasn't always been quite that small, according to figures I've seen, more like 10%, um, but, uh, but still <clears throat> not the leading producer, which is another important factor in, um, uh, in, the, uh, in this story. Okay, that's a few words about the modern situation. By the way, I'm feeling kind of detached. I can't see anybody or hear anybody. If you want to, uh, in, interrupt me. Um, I don't object to that uh, if there are questions uh, along the way. And I know this is quite a small group, so these also could be a conversation. On the other hand, I've got plenty of stuff I can talk about, I'll, and I'll try to stay within the time limit. Okay, um, here instead is a map of the, uh, the Kingdom of Naples, which after 1815 became the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies. Um, which consists, as you can see, of most of southern Italy, you probably know this, uh, and also Sicily, which is not much shown on this map. In the 18th century, uh, the Kingdom of Naples was, as I said, the leading producer of olive oil in the world. Um, these are the, show you some of the uh, provincial boundaries at the time. They're not the same as today. The areas that are most interesting to us are the Terra do Tranto, which is Lecce, the far south, the Salento, the Terra di Bari, uh, which is still Bari. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about mostly today. Um, not so much Lecce, the capital, but I will talk about Gallipoli, the small port uh, on the Ionian here, which is a fascinating uh, place and plays a, bi a big role in the story. The capital, Naples, of course, is on the uh, Tyrrhenian coast. The other part of the, those, the Terra di Bari and the Terra do Tranto are the major producers, also Calabria Ultra, uh, which is the, the tip of the toe. Um, as I mentioned, 18th century, uh, um, Neapolitan oil production is the highest uh, in the world, their most important exporter of oil, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and indeed, there was uh, encouragement from the uh, uh, royal administration to expand growth of, and plant more trees, and that goes on throughout the 18th century and into the 19th century with an interruption for 
the Napoleonic uh, Wars and periods. But let's talk first a little bit about, um, about the 18th century. Um, oil was, uh, olive oil was one of the uh, major products of the kingdom, along with uh, silk and wheat. Um, there's a lot of uh, revisionist history about Southern Italy pointing out that indeed the Kingdom of Naples, much as it was maligned after unification in the historiography of Italy, actually had a very really dynamic um, economy um, and uh, an enlightenment culture and all sorts of things, which I don't need to go into here. But notable, the most important export uh, of the kingdom was olive oil, um, and in particular olive oil from um, uh, from Puglia, from the, from the Terra del Tranto, and to a lesser extent, the Terra di Bari. Um, it wasn't exported only abroad. It was also important to um, supply the capital city of Naples, which had, uh, there was a, an administration specifically devoted to being sure that the um, urban population had enough olive oil, as it was a crucial food estimate that uh, olive oil provided a significant percentage of, um, uh, of calories in, in peasant diets, back to Roman times, um, and also as a, as a um, fuel for lighting. Um, and the picture here that's from the 19th century, not the 18th, but I'm sure the figure um, was common to both, is the Oleandolo, um, a fellow who wandered the streets of Naples selling small quantities of oil to the, to the urban residents. He had a, oats, a goatskin bag and some funnels and a in a measuring cup and would dole out small amounts of, um, uh, of oil. So that's something about oil in, in, in Naples and in the kingdom itself. It's grown almost everywhere, it's produced almost everywhere, and it's a, a staple of the, um, of the peasant diet, less so of the, um, of the diet of the well-to-do, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But why is it such an important uh, export outside of Naples, outside of the kingdom? Um, well, we get a hint about that from an entry in, of all places, the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1778. And this is a long quotation, uh, but I can't resist reading it because it, uh, it's, <laughs> I find so so delightful. So bear with me. And it's about wool production. The best wool for the manufacturing of cloths are those of England and Spain, especially those of Lincolnshire and Segovia. To use those wools to the best advantage, they must be scoured by putting them into a liquor somewhat more than lukewarm, composed of three parts fair water and one of urine. They don't specify where the source of urine is. I'd be curious to know, although it's not crucial to my research. After the wool has continued long enough in the liquor to soak and dissolve the grease, it is drained and well washed in running water. When it feels dry and has no smell but the natural one of the sheep, it is said to be duly scoured. After this, it is hung to dry in the shade, the heat of the sun making it harsh and flexible. When dry, it is beat with rods upon hurdles of wood or on cords to cleanse it from dust and grosser filth. <clears throat> the more it is thus beat and cleansed, the softer it becomes and the better for spinning. After beating, it must be well picked to free it from the rest of the filth that has escaped the rods. I mean, the sheep are living out in the nature and the, in, pasture and get all dirty and so on. So the cleaning process is extensive, as you can see. But here's the part, that, part that's important. It is now in a proper condition to be oiled and carded on large iron cards placed slopewise. Olive oil is esteemed the best for this purpose, one-fifth of which would be used for the wool intended for the woof and a ninth for the warp. The bath's a bit weird here. After the wool has been well oiled, it is given to the spinners who first card it on the knee with small fine cards and then spin it on the wheel, observing to make the thread of the warp smaller by one third than that of the woof and much compacter twisted. Okay, apologies again for, for such a long quotation, but I do think it's a, a, a remarkable passage. And, um, and so this indeed was one of the major um, reasons for which olive oil was exported. And I'd like to get some numbers on this at some point. I have numbers on total exports, estimates of total exports, but not on, on where it went, although England was the major importer um, and, and what it was used for. I need to consult some uh, British sources for that, and maybe even American. Um, so the oil was going to Britain for wool production in the 18th century. What was wool production in the 18th century? It was the spark of the Industrial Revolution. So. I think it's a remarkable connection that we have the, 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 the um, illiterate peasants, and they were mostly illiterate at the time, 
uh, almost 100 percent um, of uh, of the Salento of Puglia producing a product that was crucial to you know to wheel the oils of commerce if you to oil the wheels of commerce if you will um, uh, of this uh, revolution. Indeed, you find rep references in British uh, sources. Uh, specifically to Gallipoli oil, because the oil that was exported from Gallipoli was considered the best for this purpose. Chiaro giallo lampante, clear uh, yellow and um, either brilliant or lamp oil. And the lampante is a, a, an interesting term. Anyway, um, uh, I have another um, shorter quotation I want to share with you from Domenico Grimaldi. He was the author of that text I referred to before in, in English Instructions on the New Manufacturer of Olive Oil introduced in Calabria. He was a Calabrian Genoese uh, aristocrat who had properties in uh, Calabria and was um, advocating for improved methods of olive oil production, which he describes um, in his book, um, where he also writes, this is my, my translation, uh, oil is the most precious product of the Kingdom of Naples. The huge consumption of oil in the capital city, which I've already referred to, and in all of the kingdom's provinces for the daily preparation of foods, for lighting, for textile and soap production. Soap, of course, was another use of olive oil. And for other uses, make this noble extract deserving of governmental protection. The northern nations, and we might think Britain in this case, that have long needed our oil for the manufacture of wool and of soap have recently begun to use it for other purposes, and in particular as a welcome condiment for various foods. So that's an interesting early reference to the use of olive oil as a food um, in Britain and in, uh, in Northern Europe. It was, a, it was rarely used as a food. The major um, uh, <coughs> need for it was, um, was for wool production. Okay, um, here are some of the estimates drawn from other, uh, some, some fine historians who worked on oil in the 18th century, and uh, this is mostly uh, taken from them. But it's estimated that the kingdom is about a thousand tons of, uh, of oil per year. That compares more or less with the, the figure I showed you before. Contemporary Italy is producing between three and five hundred thousand uh, kilograms in the ton to kilo. It's um, the um, thousand kilograms, and the, they're more or less equivalent. To, we don't need to get into the specific weight of olive oil. There's a they're constantly switching back and forth between. Uh, liquid and, uh, and and weight in the measurement. Anyway, about a thousand, hundred thousand uh, tons per year produced. About somewhere between five and fifteen thousand of that exported, plus another significant percentage that was um, uh, contraband. Of course, the exports were were taxed, and those were the, what was uh, the most reliable figures: is the, the legal exports. And of those exports, the majority left from again from Gallipoli, this uh, small port I showed you in the map earlier. Uh, in Puglia, in the Terra del Tanto. It's estimated that consumption um, among the Neapolitans themselves ranged from 10 to 14 liters per capita per year, which is not that different from, uh, from today, probably, in southern, uh, in southern Italy. Um, but here it's used not only as a food, but again also uh, for lighting, which obviously is no longer uh, the case. Major expansion of, of um, cultivation in the 18th century, and you get pictures like this one. This is from Puglia before the Tilela, where really there's just olive trees as far as the eye can see. Indeed, you can still take that picture in body, but you no longer can uh, in Lecce, alas. And here instead is that port of Gallipoli, depicted by a German uh, artist. Um, and Anna, if you've been there, you'll, you can recognize the castle and the bridge. Gallipoli is a small island. It's tiny. You can walk over the circumference of it in an hour easily. It's hard to imagine that there was so much uh, activity there. Uh, I've seen uh, citations that suggest that there were as many as 70 ships uh, docked or anchored outside Gallipoli waiting for, um, to, to load up with olive oil. And this picture shows something like that uh, with all of the ships here uh, north of the town. Um, if you've been to Puglia, then you maybe have seen Gallipoli today, which looks a little bit different. But <laughs> I just couldn't resist. The picture on the bottom left gives you a, a real sense of the shape of it. Here's the port uh, uh, to the north, and those ships we saw over here. The painting was drawn from this view. Um, I don't go; I haven't gone in July or August, but I guess that that's the sort of scene that you see these days. Well, before COVID, who knows now? <laughs> um, 
I'll say a little bit about um, uh, production method. I don't want to spend too long on this. Um, uh, Gallipoli oil was industrial oil. I mean, it was just the, the peasants, as we'll see, they, they consume the same oil. But compared to the modern practices, compared to extra virgin as it's defined today, um, uh, the practices were very different. And indeed, it's probably a little bit horrifying to, um, uh, to modern producers, to high quality producers. Uh, the olives were harvested uh, starting in in the fall, but but well into the to the spring and even summer. Um, but women, mostly women and children, and this we're talking specifically about uh, the terra do tonto, although the terra di body was the same practices until the 19th century. Um, off the ground, they weren't harvested from the tree, but waited until the olives fell to the ground, which made it easier, of course. And then they were picked up by women and children uh, and transported to the presses. Um, now the before the pressing took a long time, and here are some pictures. I showed you uh, a, a drawing before, but here's a picture of a, a, of a of a crusher with the round stone that would be used, and here are three presses lined up. Um, uh, it would take a long time to process this oil. It might take 24 hours to process a batch of oil, um, not necessarily that long, but it could. Um, uh, and so, to produce that 100,000 tons of oil took a long time. In fact, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, uh, I have a calculation here of how long uh, that might have taken. Um, so the olives were harvested off the ground. They were transported um, on with mute, with uh, on animals or just carried by people to the to the thousands of mills. Um, and then the mill might not be ready for them, so they might sit uh, and ferment while they are waiting to be uh, to be crushed. Um, and of course, the millers knew that you could extract more oil by using hot water, so they would also boil water to heat it up to get the maximum oil out of the olives, producing a quality of oil that, as I say, today would be think, thought of as, as really horrible, but was that Gallipoli oil that was prized by the uh, British manufacturers. Um, another distinctive uh, characteristic of the um, oil production in Puglia, and in particular in the Salento, was that the oil presses, many of them were built underground. The, the, the stone there is very soft, and you could dig out these caverns that you see in the picture here. Uh, it had the advantage uh, for winter production that the temperature would be higher, um, and warmer temperatures make it easier to uh, extract the oil. Um, it would then be uh, stored in amphoras and in cisterns. The, I showed you Gallipoli below, before, the town of Gallipoli the, the, many of the warehouses had also in that soft stone cisterns dug out underneath where they would keep the oil, where it would settle. Um, the sediment would, would settle out of it. It would become that uh, brilliant oil that was uh, was much prized. Um, here's this calculation I referred to, uh, 100,000 tons of oil. I've, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but I figured that would require 700,000 round-the-clock person days. Um, of um, uh, of mill work. Um, so if we estimate 4,000 mills operating around the clock, it would take six months uh, to accomplish that with a workforce of over 30,000. Um, and that's about how long milling went on for a period of about six months, about half the mm -hmm. year, uh, people would be working um, in these uh, contexts. So as you can imagine, making an oil, a quality oil, which I'll, I'll come to in a moment, was, uh, was a big challenge with this uh, level of technology. Um, I don't want to spend time on this. There, there were efforts over the centuries to, to categorize oil. The best oil was usually oil fino. Virgin, as a term, would, would come to be used, as I mentioned later. And then these other qualities, mezzo fino, comuno mangiabile, lampante. Lampante actually is, interestingly, a, a, a better quality oil than oil comune, for example, that was used for soap. Today, as you may know, um, mm -hmm. we have you know, extra virgin oil, virgin oil, and then we have Lampante, which is considered the lowest quality oil in the, um, according to the legislation. Um, and there, a beautiful hundreds of year old tree, which undoubtedly um, by now has been uh, attacked by the Tilela and, uh, and dried up. The other um, major figure that um, uh, is important for the uh, for the history of olive oil in this period is a guy named Giovanni Presta. Presta was from Gallipoli. He was an oil manufacturer. Um, and he engaged in a major um, uh, 
process of experimentation. Um, he got olives from everywhere he could. He harvested starting in October every two weeks. He harvested us enough oil to make a small quantity and compared the quality over time. He got olives from different places, compared the local olives to olives to the to the other ones. And and in this uh, treatise uh, describes the results of that really methodical experimentation. Um, he was got awards from not only the um, uh, the king of uh, of Naples, but also from the uh, from the Tsarina of Russia for, for his for his oil, for the quality oil that he would send to people. Um, and he is one of those who's recommending, you know, uh, the best practices, namely, instead of harvesting from the ground, harvest from the tree, get out of those underground, smelly, disgusting presses and build them above ground, uh, and, and so on. But what's also interesting for us from his work, and then I'll, I'll move on, is the observation that 80% of oil at the time was uh, being used for wool, soap, and lighting. So only 20%, if we were to believe Presta, uh, was comestible oil, was oil used for food. And again, the, the, the peasants didn't make a distinction between food oil and, uh, and lighting oil, for example. And a tiny 1% of the oil qualified as what he called olio fino, the best quality oil made mm -hmm. from tree harvested olives, harvested in November, say, and uh, and pressed quickly after being uh, after harvesting. That, of course, was the most expensive and was consumed only by the rich. Which we'll see in the next study I want to talk about, which is um, a study carried out during uh, the Napoleonic period. Um, as you probably know, uh, the French Revolution starts in 1789, and then, of course, Naples has its revolution in 1799, um, and uh, all of the Italian peninsula is eventually occupied by, uh, by the French. Sicily remains uh, independent and protected by Britain. Um, but the Kingdom of Naples becomes, um, get, is ruled by, um, by Joaquin or Joachim, I guess, uh, Murat. Um, he becomes the king of Naples, the nephew, I think, of Napoleon, pictured here. Um, and it was a period of crisis um, for uh, olive oil and for various reasons that I, I won't um, trouble with, you with now. One, of course, is that their main um, place that they exported to Britain was blocked by the, by the continental blockade of the, uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. But Murat did something uh, remarkable and very useful for our uh, purposes, which is that he ordered a survey of the kingdom uh, and as a result produced what came to be called the Statistica Muratiana, or the, the statistics of, of Murat in 1811. Uh, this covered all sorts of, you know, it was sort of this typical French Enlightenment uh, impulse to, uh, to, to gather information. Um, and it studied the territory and the geography and the climate and the population and so on and so forth. Um, and it included uh, questions about, um, about olive oil. It didn't talk about trade and there was no olive oil trade outside of the continent. As I mentioned, um, and interestingly, it focuses specifically on comestible oil. It doesn't talk about its use for, for other purposes. But in that, it gives us really interesting insight into um, who was consuming oil, how, uh, what qualities, um, and so on. Um, and so I want to share with you um, a, few, a few excerpts from that. So each province had its own taker who went around uh, meeting with, with growers and, and, and gathering information. Um, and it's called statistics. There aren't any numbers in it, uh, but a lot of information. And so we get from Abruzzo. Abruzzo Citra, uh, this, this uh, quotation. Oil, or olio dolce, made from selected freshly harvested olives is consumed by the well-off populations in the major population centers. Strong oil instead, uh, olio forte, uh, made from olives that have sat long fermenting in vats is used by the peasants, artisans, and all those living in small towns. Strong oil has a spicy, disgusting flavor that attacks the throat but the common people prefer it, either because they're used to it or because with a small amount of oil, one can flavor a large amount of food. Um, so here we see already the distinction between uh, olio dolce for the well-off and olio uh, picante, olio forte for the, uh, for the poor. In the terra di Bari, all classes flavor their foods with oil. The common people 
and the peasants use it the most, dressing greens and legumes. In the Terra del Canto, the peasants know no other condiment. And in the Terra di Lavoro, which is Campania, this is where Naples is, all the classes use oil generally, but the poorer classes more than the wealthy. The latter use it on a small number of foods, the latter being the wealthy, for frying fish, for dressing cooked or raw greens on legumes. The poor, on the other hand, use it on greens, polenta, and the occasional legume that makes up their usual diet. And this is an important point because olive oil was the food of the poor. I mean, especially the olio, olio forte it was, the, it was the food of the poor. The rich uh, had access to animal fat. And if you look even you know, at, at this period and even later, even in the 20th century, if you look in uh, bourgeois cookbooks, Italians are cooking as often with lard as they are with olive oil. This, I, it really is in that modern period that I referred to before that olive oil gets this quality as the most privileged fat, the most, uh, you know, that, that, that every, the qualities of which everyone praises. Uh, it wasn't necessarily the case uh, in this period and, and not for, for much of this, the period that I studied. Okay, I should, uh, should, should pick up the pace a little so I can finish within my, my time limit. Um, but I do want to say something about the, a little more about the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, a big change in the production of oil in this region comes about in the early uh, 19th century when a Frenchman named Pierre Ravanard um, migrates to 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 Bari, to the Terre de Bari. Uh, he had been a, a producer and a, an exporter, and he decided to settle down in Bari and produce uh, his own oil. Um, and he introduced those practices that Presta and Grimaldi had advocated, namely harvesting from the tree. He introduced new um, they're still uh, two cycle presses, but they were um, more more efficient crushers and presses um, and was able to speed up the process and so improve the quality uh, by several times. Um, and he started producing an oil in body that was fetching double the, the usual oil that was made there. Indeed, competing with other European oils. At the time, the best oils were considered to be those from uh, from Aix-en-Provence, which is where Ravanas come, came from, from, uh, uh, from Genoa, and from Lucca in Tuscany. Um, and as we'll see, Ravanas established the tradition that would then continue, by which um, Bari, as opposed to the Terra del Tanto, became the center of high quality oil production in uh, Puglia. Um, Terra del Tanto, the olio di Gallipoli, had been the best industrial oil, but the best food oil would body. And although he ultimately uh, went bankrupt, uh, he was, uh, his practices were, were adopted and, uh, uh, and as I say, body, well, I'll give you the testimony in just a moment, uh, emerges as a major producer of quality oil. So Italy is unified in 1861. There is no more kingdom of the two Sicilies after that. It's absorbed, some would say occupied by the new state. Um, and so Neapolitan production becomes Italian production. Um, and we get uh, various comments, a couple of comments that I'm going to cite for you about, uh, about, the, about Southern oil. Uh, one of them comes from Alessandro Bizzari. And now this is significant because he's a Tuscan, right? And you can imagine Tuscan pride about Tuscan oil. Uh, and he writes instead in 1879, the province of Bari has made great strides in oil production. Its comestible oils now travel around the world and it can be described as a model Southern province. Today, the two Italy are the oil of Luca, that's of course his oil, and the oil of Bari. Similarly, um, just like the Statistica Maratiana, uh, the unified state, the new Italian state, sought to understand itself through data, uh, statistics, if you will, um, and so carried out an agricultural um, survey or study in the 1870s and 80s, led by a guy named uh, Stefano uh, Iaccini. Um, and Yacini, uh, his study uh, also cites the, um, the, the oldi soprafini, as they, they're called there, of Bari as being among the best uh, oils <coughs> in Italy, but also observes uh, in places like Rome um, that frequently you're not getting pure uh, uh, pressed olive, you're not getting pure olive oil, uh, but instead there's a new I, I don't know, I can't give you a date, but a, a, a new phenomenon uh, that um, will be important for the history of olive oil to the present day, which is the blending of olive oil with other less expensive oils. Because 
the production of seed oils throughout the 19th century, thanks also to industrial um, processes, uh, is becoming cheaper and cheaper. Um, and so they don't cost as much as olive oil produced by the, the techniques of, of Ravanas and others. Um, and so frequently um, we see merchants blending seed oils and olive oil and selling it just as olio, which to most people meant olive oil at the time. Um, and so, you know, making it more of a profit. This would be the focus, of course, of uh, Italian and, and non-Italian oil legislation for the ne next couple of centuries. Um, or century and a half. Um, another big change that comes after unification, of course, this is leads us starting in the 1870s, but but peaking in the uh, couple of decades before World War One. This is the period when Italians uh, migrated around the world um, in the millions um, to North America, to South America, to Australia, and so on. And with them, of course, they took their foodways, um, and in particular, a demand for uh, for olive oil. So we get a sort of a change, whereas in the 18th century, almost all exports, oil exports from the Kingdom of Naples were industrial oil going to England and Russia and other places like that, and even the, even, even the United States. <clears throat> in the late 19th and then into the 20th century, we get comestible oil being following the, uh, the paths of Italian migration. So we get olive oil imported to New York City and to Buenos Aires and to, to places like this. Uh, which obviously has a history of its own associated with organized crime and so on that uh, is worth um, uh, exploring. Nonetheless, in this period and into even into the 1950s, um, it's still uh, unusual. It's very difficult to find olive oil in a place like England, comestible oil in a place like England. And even in Milan, right, even across the Apennine, most people don't consume olive oil. Uh, the, the rates of consumption of olive oil in uh, in Milan are one or two liters per person per year, whereas in, in, in Puglia they're in 20-something liters per year. Um, it, all, olive oil hasn't achieved that status of Evo today where everyone thinks it's the, it's the, it's the greatest uh, fat and the, and the most uh, prestigious um, of fat. That will only happen in that modern period after 1960. So I'll make a, a few comments about the 20th century and then I'll stop talking because I've been talking too much. Um, I've already referred to this idea of the decline of industrial oil and increased exports of comestible oil. Um, and there are two, two things that, that, that occur beginning in the late 19th century and sort of are the uh, uh, major points of concern in the 20th century. One is the blending of oils that I mentioned before. So getting cheaper cottonseed oil or something like that and blending it with olive oil. I mean, if you tell people that's what you're selling and that's what they're, they're willing to buy, that's fine. But of course, it was frequently just sold as being pure olive oil and it wasn't. Um, and the other technique that was uh, developed was re refining of oil. Now, this is uh, parallel to the development of seed oils and industrial processes for um, producing oil. They also found ways to refine oil. In some ways, we might say, this necessary development, right? We had a situation in the 18th century where 1% of the oil was oleofino, 20% was comestible, and 80% was industrial, and probably not very good for eating. How are you going to turn all of that oil into comestible oil um, with the technology they had at the time, even with Ravanas improvements? Um, it was a big challenge. And so much of that oil would be uh, refined, which would um, uh, by chemical methods reduce the acidity of the oil, and then that might be blended uh, with, 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 with better quality um, uh, virgin oils. Um, and indeed, we get a series of laws in Italy, because Italy is the, uh, in the vanguard in this regard, to control blending, refining, and the labeling of laws. The first labeling law is 1936, which defines what virgin oil is meant to be. And that means, in this case, it means unrefined. I, I could tell you more about how the term was used in the past, but I, I don't want to spend time on that now. But in 1936, virgin oil was unrefined and, uh, and, that, and the attempt was made to um, enforce a law regarding the labeling of, and the marketing of oils. Blending was um, eventually <clears throat> made illegal in Italy. It's, um, it's still practiced in, uh, in the US and other places to this day. Other big developments in the 20th century, I mentioned already the increase of Spanish production, so that, in fact, Spanish production will overtake Italian production in the middle of the 20th century, uh, which is ironic because, of course, Spain was uh, one of the major suppliers of oil to ancient Rome. So, like, it's gone full circle. 
Um, and indeed, Italy becomes, um, already by the 1940s, an important oil importer. Now, this seems a bit crazy because Italy produces uh, more than enough oil for, its, for consumption in Italy and exports a large quantity as well. Um, and there's these new markets in, um, in the U.S. and Argentina and so on. And indeed, it's because of those new markets that the importing that takes place because much of this oil imported mostly from Spain uh, goes to those refineries and is in the language of one study that I looked at rectified um, so the acidity is lowered it's bottled and sold as Italian oil okay, and there's another issue that continues to be a concern um, and, and indeed with the passage of certain laws becomes uh, becomes illegal um, there's other stuff that I've encountered in the 50s stories of uh, you know, they developed techniques where they could um, process animal remains and soap and turn it into oil. And that was being sold as olive oil. Uh, and this caused huge scandals. There were stories of big importing of soap into, into Genoa is the center of, of much of the refineries and, and, and Liguria. Why were they importing all this soap to Liguria in 1954 or whenever it was? Um, the picture I have here of a, uh, a bottle of oil I found on the web yesterday, it's being sold for eight euros. And this is a, uh, you know, today, by law, the label thing is with what, what they are. And this one just says, describes itself as an olive oil made up of refined olive oil and a virgin olive oil. Now that product has been sold for a lot, for at least a century um, uh, and more, uh, not always labeled as such. Today it's labeled as such, perhaps there's a market for it. The fact is, if you look at the supermarket shelves, in the U.S., you don't see anything but extra virgin. I have almost impossible to find an oil that's not labeled extra virgin. Um, in um, in Italy, of course, you can still find olio vergine. You can find olio di sansa and others as well. Um, but you know, one does have to wonder when the when the law was passed in 1960, um, about 20% of the production at the time qualified not as extra virgin but as virgin. Uh, so how do we get to a situation today where 90% is extra virgin? Well, in part because of those technological advances, but of course there's always suspicion that in part uh, it's because of um, uh, inaccurate labeling or fraudulent labeling, in, in, certainly in Europe or by law. The laws are <coughs> are much better now, and, and, and obviously there's a lot of control of what's going on. The final thing I'll mention, and then I'll stop, um, is um, the... Um, Development, this modern, the other aspect of the modern history of oil after 1960s and the development of the extra virgin law is it's just this time that the American, what is he, a physiologist, I guess, um, uh, Ansel Keys is doing his seven country study. Now, this study, it's been well documented, is full of flaws and problems, but it was hugely influential. The graph on this page is from it, um, and in that it suggested that heart disease was linked to the excessive consumption of animal fats. And indeed, countries that consumed olive oil, Greece, Italy, um, had much lower levels of, uh, of heart disease. Now, again, it's a problematic study. I don't need to go into that. But this was the, the, the seed, if you will, of the Mediterranean diet, which has since been um, uh, given special status by UNESCO and is celebrated around the world and part of this, again, this modern history, which isn't really what I've been talking about today. But anyway, apologies for going on so long. Um, I, will, uh, I will stop there. Perhaps somebody has some, some questions and maybe I'll stop the share. I don't know if there's any way to see people. But Thank you so much, Carla. Very interesting Welcome. talk. Um, also, I hope to have time to be in dialogue with you in Polenzo because we are sharing together the same interest uh, in the Mediterranean and uh, in food studies, so I hope to have time uh, to be in dialogue with you in Polenzo. But I have seen uh, on the chat that there is a first uh, question for you. Uh, Agnes uh, um, uh, has written, I'm curious to know if uh, any oil was ever found in a shipwreck in an amphora or are we solely uh, relying on text uh, to know the taste? Yeah, I have, I have not heard of the discovery of any uh, ancient oil. Um, of course, you know, the problem with oil, unlike wine, is that it, um, it starts to deteriorate as soon as you make it. It's, it, uh, it's best, you know, right off the press. Um, and then it has to be protected from light and from air. And, you know, uh, even people, people who make quality oil today won't even enter in a in a, uh, uh, a competition 
in September, uh, right? You need to taste their oil in January when it's when it's fresh. Um, uh, there are, you know, Presta talks about the oil from the Terra del Cranto that can last two, three, four years. Now, what he means by that, it's hard to know. And I, too, am really curious to know what were these flavors like, you know, of this oil that was the olives were gathered off the ground, and fermented for a month or two months before it was pressed. And people were consuming that, were eating it. But indeed, we're only relying, all, all I know are documentary sources. There are no, of course, there are famously in, in Rome, there's the, the Monte Testaccio, which is made up of broken amphora um, from, uh, from oil imported to, uh, to ancient Rome, from, from Libya, from Tunisia, from Spain, from Andalusia. But, uh, but we don't know anything about, uh, uh, we don't have any evidence of the flavor except for what people describe it as, I'm afraid. It would be really interesting to know. I'm always curious about that. Okay, thank you so much. Anya, you want to add something? I have seen that you open your mic. No. Yes. The chat says that Agnes lost her sound and missed the answer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Um, in the meanwhile, I would like to ask you one you, question. You, Agnes? You, Agnes? Well, that's, uh, that's not me. <laughs> okay, it works, I hope. Um, my question for you, Carl, is about uh, uh, the representation connected to olive oil in the history um, of Italy. Um, as you said, there's a wide range of uh, different olive oils and uh, different ways of representing uh, the olive oil, of trying to describe uh, different typologies of oil. Um, and um, I would like to connect this uh, to the Italian identity and um, the thing that um, the idea of an Italian identity, uh, we can say that is imposed from a north on the south uh, of uh, the country. And I would like to ask you if uh, this um, wide range of different olive oils, in your opinion, can be connected to different uh, um, Italian identities in uh, different uh, places uh, of the south uh, and if this can be important for problematizing the idea of a unique uh, Italian identity. Sure, are you still there? Yeah. Can, uh, does someone saying there's a connection is poor right now? Can, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 sure, yes. Okay, okay. I, I heard you clearly. Um, yeah, you know, I think the, the, the identity that you're talking about uh, is largely an invention. Um, and, I mean, if you could consider the fact, I mean, which is not to discount the question, it's an interesting one. But I've got sources um, in Correa de la Sera from, I don't remember if it's the 30s or the 50s, um, talking about the fact that, you know, the Milanese, they do not consume olive oil. They're horrified at the idea of spaghetti with olive oil on it. Maybe they'll use it to fry fish on Fridays because they are not allowed to use anything else. But, you know, that's about it. Um, so to, to think of olive oil as, you know, the sort of epitomizing Italian cuisine, mm. it didn't. It did it some places. Um, but at the, the king of Naples, he might have his food cooked with lard as, as, as frequently as with olive oil. And apparently he got olive oil from Provence. Right, he preferred that to the to the to the, the oil from his own kingdom, uh, even the even the best quality, of course. Um, you know, it's again, it was a food of the peasants. I think about you know like rye bread or dried pod or you know in European food history, that was the role of that olive oil had until until recently. Um, uh, you know, except for you know a few of these pioneers like Vesta and and Grimaldi who were making good oil and, and advocating for it and. I mean, maybe that's an exaggeration because, of course, they were their their work was recognized. Um, Sicily didn't make any good oil in the, in the 19th century, uh, and there was no reference. The references to oil from there, uh, Bizzari in 1879 says, you know, it's just horrible. 
Um, now, of course, today Sicily makes some of the best oil in Italy, and we would be hard pressed not to say that olive oil isn't quintessentially part of, of Sicilian cuisine. But that requires some exploration, right? Because you know, the, the oil quality wasn't always um, always good there. Tuscany can claim that they've made them the best oil in Italy for as long as anyone can remember. Um, at the same time, they produced so little that when the demand went up, what did they do? They bought oil from Bari in bulk, put it in bottles with a Tuscan label, and sold it. I mean, this is, you know, the, uh, you could, you'll hear that from any old guy who works um, in, uh, in oil in, um, uh, in Buglia, you'll hear that. Uh, and, it's, and it still happens today. It's just now that we're more open about it. Yevole makes one of the best products, best oils, Tuscan company. One of their oils is from a bit of the mill where it's made, in Puglia. Um, um, but it's labeled now as, a, as an oil from Puglia. It's a, it's a, um, uh, a Coratina from, uh, from the Nord Barese. Um, so... Yes, of course, it's part of the identity, but it's a complicated story, and it's there's a lot of invention. In, in, in this, you know, when we try to say, "Oh, yeah, this is centuries-long tradition," well, yes and no. <laughs> Some places, yeah. yes, but yeah. less in, less in others. Torino does not have a centuries-long tradition of all <laughs> consumption because they don't produce any. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Anyway. And I would say to 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 Chiara's question about northern France and butter, it's the yeah. same story. Yeah, right. The oil is produced in the south. That's where we see the. It, it, the consumption, um, you know, in in Italy, north of the Apennines, north of of the Mar Marche, you know, it's olive oil. There was some imported from some of the oil from Bari goes up the Adriatic uh, to Venice and places like that. But um, but even then, probably more often used for lighting uh, historically than uh, than as food. Okay, there's another hey, question. There's another question by Federica Schmier. Uh huh. Yes, I, I sympathize with you, Federica. I, I see the question. How do you choose an olive oil today? Well, uh, one advantage you have that I, we do not is that the European laws now are pretty good. Uh, and you can probably believe that you're, what it says on the label is what you're getting, like that bottle I showed you, that usual bottle. That's from Liguria, of the, the blend of refined and, and uh, extra virgin olive oil. The best oils are going to be single producer oils. They're not going to be, you know, you look look at a bottle and it says this is made from extra virgin olive oil sourced from within the EU and outside the EU. That's a frequent, frequently on bottles in Italy, right? So it could be from anywhere. Now, not that they don't make good oil in Tunisia, they do, um, but you know, this kind of oil are big um, producers blending to get the lowest prices, and the and the and the prices in the in, in the supermarket are are impossible for, for quality oil. Um, but if you get 100% extra virgin from a single producer, um, that identifies the harvest date, right? So this is, we're now in April of, uh, of 2021. You want to get oil that was harvested in late 2020, uh, in, in, in November, December of this past year, October, December of this past year, not the 2019 oil that's still on the shelf because it's not gonna be as good. Unfortunately, ultimately, <laughs> the best thing is to know the producer, uh, which is not so easily achieved. Um, uh, I would, you know, recommend talking to, um, uh, not going to the supermarket, um, where you really don't know, you know, I mean, as I say, the labels in Italy, Italian supermarkets are good. In the, in the U.S., you never know what you're getting. But, but go to a, um, a food sh sh seller, a quality food seller, um, who knows his his or her product and can tell you about them and recommend them? You're going to pay more. You're not going to pay eight or nine euros a a, a liter. Uh, you're going to pay you know fifteen, uh, but you get a much much better product. Uh, thank you for the answer. I just want to add a secondary question: Can we recognize the quality by the price of the oil? Well, yes and no. I mean, there's some insanely expensive oils, and I don't know that they um, uh, reflect the quality. What you, what I would say, if you're getting an oil for less than, well, I've seen, I've purchased good oils from the producer in Puglia for 10 euros a, a liter. But by the time it gets to the store, it's going to cost more. So I would think less than 15 euros. I would be I would be dubious about what you're getting. 
Um, it's just not not possible to to make a good quality oil with you know proper harvesting techniques and production techniques, not blending in any refined oil um, uh, at those prices. That you know the stuff in the supermarket that's that's cheap, you know that can't be good quality. Uh, I would say, and and tasting some of them confirms that in my experience. Okay, Agnes, you want to say something? Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah? I'm yeah. sorry, I missed uh, the answer about uh, the finding the foods, uh, the oil in an old vessel because my earphone died. But I have a question. Uh. <laughs> That's okay, I'll look at the one <laughs> at the recording. Um, I have a question with regards um, to to the regain, uh, the, the re reborn of everything that's all now and the regain interest in way of doing things the way they were done before. Has there been any yeah. interest anywhere about producing oil, even a small scale, uh, the way it was produced back then, um, just out of curiosity? Yes, um, yeah, there, there is. Okay, so yeah, that's it's very romantic, right? I mean, when you see even the Frantoi Ipoje in Puglia underground, they look very beautiful and romantic. You can visit some of them that have been, been uh, preserved. They were probably horrible places to work in, but they look nice without the, you know, the smell of the men and the oxen and the manure and the fires and, and the fermenting olives and things like that. Um, but there, there is a, a nostalgia for that technique even above ground. Um, and you know you have the main the restoration of, of mills I think in, in Tuscany too and other places with the big stone mills, and there are still those who um, who believe you make a better oil that way. I've talked to older guys who who are nostalgic about and producers um, who say yeah we made we made better oil when we when we did it in the, in the old way. It was much slower, so the oil is exposed to oxygen much longer. The olives are, which is uh, deteriorates the quality. I would be imagined that the oil coming off the press um, might still be very high quality. Indeed, I've tasted some, but it won't last as long because the beauty of this of the of the continuous cycle, once they get the problems of heating and things under control, is that you can produce an oil that that is exposed to oxygen very little um, and get it into the bottles and filter it to get out the which also um, um, lead to a deterioration in quality. That said, there are a few old mills still around. I visited one uh, last year. I was last in, in, in Italy in November of, uh, uh, of 2019, since because of COVID, I haven't been back since. Um, but I visited a, a mill there, and there were people who, you know, locals who still go there because they believe that they're making better oil that way. <laughs> and there's, there was even one guy who was from there, but lived in London or in England, and he would produce oil and take it to England and sell it on the, because it was made the old fashioned way. That was a selling point for, for his oil. And we tasted a, a very nice oil that was made then. Then we tasted another one and, and the guy said, this is what most of my clients want. And I'm, I've done olive oil tasting, but I was with people who were, are certainly more expert than me is, uh, um, as olive oil uh, sommelier, and they thought this oil was horrible. <laughs> but, you know, that's the local taste. Who's to say that that's, that's not good oil, right? That's the oil that people from there have always had, the older generation. They don't like the spicy, you know, oil that is, is it fetches high prices today that the, that the younger and, and, and avant-garde uh, producers are making. So there is still nostalgia for the old way, and there's still some people who are practicing it, indeed, and, and advocating it. Um, but not very many. Right, because I was going to say, I mean, uh, one can really talk about an acquired taste. I mean, for olive oil, you know, being French and living most of the time in Italy, I love oil from there, but now I'm in the States for family reasons. And I think that the oil we find is horrible because it's flavorless. You know, I mean, to me, I, I think, and going back to the discussion you had earlier, about the flavor that was despicable for the rich and normal for the poor might might come back into fashion. But anyways, it's just a yeah. I expect. I don't know if it will come back into fashion, but indeed, you know, like so there are those producers 
who make a high quality oil and get a good price for it and they're doing just fine. But there are many of them who are frustrated because you know, the, the, the large public in Italy or anywhere else doesn't really appreciate the effort that goes into making that oil and maybe doesn't even prefer it. They might like a, a they find, for example, a Coratina from Puglia is really strong and many people find it overpowering. Some people think it's the greatest oil in the world. Others prefer a milder oil like, you know, like an oil from, I see I mentioned of, of Liguria, which tends to be milder um, and a beautiful oil. Um, but, um, you know, everyone has, has different tastes in this regard. But there's a important distinction between those quality oils and the, the more industrial oil. Now, the other discussion that is big today is the super high intensity. Because the, I've met a grower in California, and by the way, in the U.S. there are good oils, but you, you have to search for them. Send me an email and I can give you some references. Uh, I have a couple of friends who make excellent oils in California by tradition, by not not super high intensive ones, but super high uh, super high um, intensity, or rather super high density in, in English super intensivo in Italian method makes an oil where the machine tree, that row of trees and um, uh, harvest the olive takes them straight to the press where they're processed and the the the, the people who market it say these these oils olives have never been touched by human hands right and this is the fastest way. To, to get them processed, to get them to the mill, and this is how we make this high-quality oil. Now, you could, there are only certain olives that work for uh, for super high density. The uh, connoisseurs don't think they make the best oil, um, but you know they make a they make a product that may appeal uh, to the consumer, um, and particularly because the price is lower. Sorry, I could go on and on. <laughs> Probably should start. Uh -huh. No, thank you, Carl. Thank you so much for your answer. I don't know if there are uh, other questions. If you want to write, I see. Something. I see the question about about Genova, and and I don't uh, know. I mean, Genova, Ligurian yeah. oils are much prized. You know, there's the oil. There's some oils from Liguria, from Garda, of all places. You know that they make a few liters a year, probably. But uh, is um, that's an exaggeration? Is is considered you know wonderful stuff? But it is. It was in Liguria that they. They um, uh, pioneered the uh, refining of oils. They eventually established uh, refineries also in in, um, in Puglia. That's a history I have to learn more about. I mean, I'm hoping to write a monograph on this topic. That's what I'll be working on this coming year when I have some free time. This year, I haven't had a lot of free time. COVID has been, I don't know about your experience, but I found that teaching a week online uh, requires a lot more time. Uh, than uh, than what I devote, devoted to it in the past, so it's been a little bit of a challenge. But hopefully, I will have better answers to those questions and, and learn more about that dimension, because it's a really interesting one. The, the refinery. I don't think people don't like to talk about it much now. They want to talk about you know the high quality oils that are winning competitions uh, and so on. But I'm interested in, in the other side too. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions for? Sorry, there are, are there any questions? I see the, the question on maybe old school Millie will become hip again, like natural wine. Maybe, maybe people will like those kind of funky flavors, <laughs> like uh, natural wine. <laughs> okay. Be a little surprised, but. Thank you, Agnes. Uh, so. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Carl, for this lecture. And I hope uh, we can meet you in Pollenzo and be in dialogue with you on this topic. Yeah, I do too. Hopefully, I'll be there in September. I'm okay. Looking forward to it. Hopefully, That's the fun. students will be too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.